My name is Mike Ferrari and thank you very much for coming today. I'm going to spend some time with you today sharing a recent journey um, that I started about 18 months ago and that I'm still on. And it's a journey to wellness. And in a few slides you're going to start to understand why I had to do that. So uh, just a short time ago, um, I weighed in at a hefty 222 pounds with 42% body fat. So I'm five foot four, just to give you a reference. If you're not familiar with body fat percentages, um, anything over 26 is considered obese. Anything under 20 is considered lean or in shape. Uh, I'll let you use your imagination what 42 means. Okay. So as far back as I can remember, I've been called all of those adjectives. Uh, the, f the fun one uh, is husky. Now let me tell you where that comes from. If you don't have little boys who are overweight, you don't know what that means. But if you do, you understand that husky is where you take little boys who can't fit in the normal boys' clothes. And that normally means wider waists and shorter legs. So that was definitely me. I spent most of my life as morbidly obese. So morbidly obese is defined as having a BMI or a body mass index of greater than 35 with at least one medical condition related directly to weight. I was lucky enough to have two. Two. Now BMI, you know, some folks we can wrestle with that or not, but you know, BMI is kind of, um, it's kind of a strange number because you could take a, a well-tuned athlete with, who has a lot of lean mass, a lot of muscle, and his BMI number could be big, right? Um, so BMI isn't the greatest, which is why, by the way, that I used body fat, because that was really important for me, and I'm gonna get into a little bit of that later. Um, the two weight-related uh, medical issues that I had were hypertension and hyperlipidemia, which is a great combination of high cholesterol and high triglycerides. So if you've gone to uh, your family physician, you've had um, blood work done, uh, I'm sure that they've talked to you about those numbers. Um, here's the thing, I was kept healthy with three prescription drugs, meaning that my numbers were kept under control as long as I took three prescription drugs every single day. So I did everything right. I did everything right. I went to the doctor, I had my yearly physicals, I had my blood work, and all my numbers were good. My blood pressure was under control, my cholesterol, my triglycerides. I was completely healthy. Why change? Why would you change if it wasn't broken, right? There's nothing wrong. Blood pressure was 120 over 80 with medication. Um, triglycerides were within range, LDL, HDL. Everything was in, within range. I was happy, a good life, great family, nice little business, good numbers, I'm good. So prior to being put on prescription drugs, my numbers weren't really that bad. Uh, but I have terrible family history. Uh, by the time my father was my age, he had already passed. By the time my mother was my age, she had already had one cardiac arrest and she went on to have uh, two more cardiac incidences and she was well on her way to a full-blown type two diabetes. And my brother um, has active heart disease right now. So what the doctor said, and I, I believe wisely so, he said, you know, we need to kind of get in front of this a little bit. In my early 40s, he said, we need to um, get that blood pressure down. We need to get those uh, um, cholesterol numbers down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put you on this med and we're gonna put you on this med and that's gonna help that. And it worked. And you know, he, he did exactly what he should do as my primary care physician. So I'm good, preventative medicine, numbers are good. By the way, they were just light doses. That's what I told myself, right? Anybody say, well, do you take any pills? Oh, I take a light dose of blood pressure medicine. I take a light dose of cholesterol medicine. Numbers are still good. So I go to the doctor regularly, the numbers are good. He doesn't ever yell, doesn't ever threaten, doesn't ever chastise me. Never mind the part about the fact that I had to rest every time I went up a flight of stairs or had to take the trash out or had to do anything uh, that required physical exertion. Here's the thing, I don't, 
blame my doctor at all. A matter of fact, I have a great doctor. My doctor is about my age, uh, has uh, a family that's about in my situation as far as children and age-wise. Uh, good guy, very smart. Um, but you know, these, these doctors, men and women, are seeing four, five, six patients every hour, every hour, every hour. And if you look at the obesity rates in the West, North America, Canada, Western Europe, they're pretty high. They're pretty high. And I'm certain that these men and women just get tired of telling people, you probably ought to lose a little weight, probably ought to eat a little better, you probably ought to get a little exercise. And not that he didn't mention those things to me, but he didn't harp on them. And uh, I looked at that as a good thing, right? Every time I'd leave my yearly physical, call my wife, everything's good, hon. Got the blood work, everything's good. Didn't yell. So as it turns out, I'm not very photogenic, right? Did you ever look at a photo of yourself and wince? I just don't take good photos. Uh, camera's not so good, everybody else looks good. You know, I'm just not very photogenic. That's what I told myself, right? I once tried to take a selfie. Everybody, has everyone taken a selfie? I once tried to take a selfie. I've never done it before, right? So I, I take the camera and I hold it up and it's nothing but head. And I'm like, what the heck? I don't, what am I doing? So I'm adjusting. There's nothing but head. So I leaned the phone against the wall and I backed up and I had to get about 10 feet before there was more than, you know, I could see my ears. Then it occurs to me you can't touch the screen. So you can't really take a selfie. But your you could put it on. It's just your arm. You can put it. That's it. I have short arms. <laughs> that's what I needed. It was a selfie stick. So what happened? So one morning I had an awakening. One morning I woke up. The truth is, I went into the bathroom, start my morning routine, I look in the mirror, I'm getting ready to shave, and I was just like, enough. Enough. This had to stop. My entire life, at this point I'm, you know, maybe 53, 54 years old, my entire life I had been dealing with this condition. And I had had enough. I was tired of the way I felt, I was tired of the way I looked, I was tired, tired of the way my clothes fit or didn't fit, tired of the way I felt. Let me tell you about that. Every day like clockwork, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I would crash. I could literally sit at my desk and fall asleep, literally, with like out even trying get up in the morning, I, my legs would be achy, my back would be achy. I just didn't feel good. My numbers were good, by the way. I just didn't feel good. But I was ashamed. And the reason why I was ashamed, not because I was overweight, but because I was deceiving myself. I was talking myself into the fact that I was healthy. I was talking myself into the fact that the last time I was at the doctor, he didn't yell at me. I was talking myself into the fact that as long as I took my pills, which by the way, everybody does, I was fine. And that really bothered me. Because I, I, I do pride myself in being self-aware, kind of understanding my, my faults and understanding my weaknesses, where I need to work on things, you know, those types of things. And I just chose to ignore this. And it really bothered me. So I've got to make some changes. If I don't want to live like this any longer, there's only one way to make that change because my, my diseases, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, were directly related to my weight. They just were. And if you continue to go down that path that I was on, type 2 diabetes was definitely in my future. Now, yes, the cards are stacked against me from um, uh, family history, of course, right? But you couldn't carry around that kind of weight on this frame, have no physical activity, not really monitor what you're eating, and not be headed down that road. Um, didn't want to feel bad because there was something that I wanted to do that I couldn't do, right? So uh, I'm an active youth baseball coach. I really like doing it, coach uh, teenage baseball. And, you know, it had gotten to the point where I couldn't do half the things that I was asking the kids to do. So what kind of a coach are you if you can't even demonstrate what it is that you're trying to get them to do? Well, to stop making excuses, and I really didn't know what to do, I was at a loss. 
So to admit that to you isn't really easy. So if you know me, what you know is that um, I really like to be in control of myself. I really like to be in control of my situations. I like to be in control of my businesses. I don't like surprises that get out of hand. And for me to be at a loss was not very easy. For me to admit that to you is even harder. So, I've seen all of this before. See, because as it turns out, I've lost and gained and lost and gained and lost and gained probably more weight than some of you weigh right now. All of my adult life being morbidly obese, I've done a lot of this. I've done it all. If you can name it, I've done it. I've done Atkins. I've done crazy amounts of cardio. I've done crazy restrictive calories. I've done low carb. I've done crazy restrictive calories and a bunch of cardio. I've done it all. And all of it, guess what? Every single one of it, it all worked. I lost weight on every single one. Without exception, I lost weight. Yet, we keep coming back to where I was. Every time. Now here's a dirty little secret. Have you, has, has anyone, everyone here is familiar with the Biggest Loser, right? Okay. Have you ever heard of the Biggest Loser Syndrome? Anybody? One, two, good. So the biggest loser syndrome is what happens to the contestants when they go home. It's not just the fact that they're not working out six and seven hours a day. And it's not just the fact that they're being restricted to these little tiny morsels of food, which is what they're, they're given, which causes them to lose weight. Surprise! Uh, the syndrome is this. When you lose a bunch of weight quickly, your metabolism slows down, tries to match what's going on in your body. But here's the rotten part. If you gain the weight back, your metabolism doesn't fire back up to where it was. Which is why when you hear the yo-yo syndrome where you lose weight and then gain it back, then some, that's where the then some comes from. Because your metabolism has slowed down. So I didn't know what to do, but the fact is I knew exactly what to do. What I wanted was something that was going to be sustainable, not something that I was going to do for three, four, or five months and then stop doing whatever that was and come right back to the unhealthy part. In fact, all those times where I gained and lost weight, I never came off of any of the meds because in here, I knew eventually I was going to get back. If I couldn't do whatever it was that I was going to do for the next 25 or 30 years, I wasn't going to do it. Right? You can go on these super calorie restrictive diets, right? You can join, there's, there's these clubs, there's meal plans, and they send you three little things this big. Could you imagine a 220 pound guy eats three meals that big and a bar or a shake, and at the end of the day, he's not only starving, but he does that for three or four months and guess what? He loses a lot of weight. And the second he comes off of the plan, stops buying the meals, he puts the weight right back on. It happens. It happens every time. So it has to be sustainable. It's got to be healthy and it's got to help me reach my goals of a long and productive life. So. For those of you who don't know me, I love to work. No matter what the work is, I really enjoy going to work. It's something that I want to do. People talk to me about retirement and it's right over my head. I mean, it's not even in the cards because I really get a lot of enjoyment out of work. No matter what kind of work it is, I enjoy it. So if I'm going to live and continue to work, I've got to have some health behind me. So could a medical doctor help? Well, for sure. I, I, I think a medical doctor could help. Here's another dirty little secret. Medical doctors, uh, physicians, your family care physician, mine, they get a lot of training, an enormous amount of training. These are super bright people that spend years and years and years in college. And the amount of training that they get on weight management and nutrition is about that much. It's really tiny. It's really tiny. So they can help you with anecdotal information, 
but they're not necessarily going to be able to help you with everything that you really need. You know, I can remember one time, this was years ago, a different doctor getting um, uh, a Xerox copy of a 1200 calorie diet. That was their answer to help me. Completely worthless. Everything, and this, this is just about everything that you need to know can be found on the internet. All of it. Whether it has to do with diet, exercise, nutrition, building a car, fixing a car, everything can be found. Here's the problem with the internet. The problem with the internet is 99% of everything on there is either wrong, false, a half-truth, or a hidden sales promotion. There's a lot of stuff that you need to go through to get the good information. It's on there, it's really hard to go through. So for two months, I read, I talked to people, I watched things, I listened, I asked questions, and I continually tried to learn. One of the problems that I have is sometimes I overthink, I over-research, and I over-learn. So at one point I said, okay, I got what I need, what I don't know, I'm going to outsource. I'm going to get somebody to help me with because I have to get started. And that's exactly what I did. Um, the basics are really, really true. What you just said is really, really true. If you reduce calories, you exercise, you're going to lose weight. Simple, right? Exercise, reduce your calories, you're going to lose weight. The devil's in the details, like everything. The devil's in the details, right? That basic truth stands for all, except what works for me may not necessarily work for you and it's probably not going to work for you. It just isn't. So in order for me to regain my health, I have to lose the weight and I had to lose a lot of weight. It's just the way it was. This wasn't, it did not start out as a vanity project. It really didn't. It started out as a health project. Don't get me wrong. It's not too bad when the vanity comes with it right? And clothes start to fit the way they're actually supposed to fit. That's like a bonus, but it really started out as a health project. So here's some of the problems, right? What do you eat? How much do you eat? What are micros and macros that everybody's talking about? Does it matter when I eat? What's intermittent fasting and what are they talking about with that? How much water do I drink? Can I still drink beer? How about date night? Date night was really super important. I'm going to talk about date night here in a little bit. Uh, it's really, really super important. So one of the first things that I had to learn to do was learn how to read a nutrition label. Now everybody said, well, I know how to do that. Okay, you probably do, but I didn't. So I want to share with you some of the things that I learned. Amount of servings is a sneaky little thing that we all need to pay attention to. You pick it up and it says it's a hundred calories and then in fine print you see four servings. So the whole bag isn't hundred calories, it's 400 calories. You're supposed to have a quarter of it. Hmm, that's interesting. Interesting areas, places that you should uh, pay attention to. Fats and the types of fats. Fiber, dietary fiber, which is really, really important. Proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, and vitamins. I had to learn all of this. And I had to learn things like, you, you notice that all these things are in grams. It's very universal. They're all in grams. Well, what does that mean? And how do they come up with calories? All of this is in grams of stuff. But up here, they give us calories. How does that happen? Well, as it turns out, there's a really simple formula. For every gram of protein is four calories. For every gram of carbohydrate, four calories. For every gram of fat, saturated or unsaturated, it's nine. That's how they come up with the number. So sometime if you're sitting around or where you want to play a little game with your kids or your grandkids or whatever, get a nutrition label and a calculator out and start doing some of the math. Four, four, and nine. It's very, very simple. So when people talk about macronutrients, what they're talking about is fat, carbohydrates, and protein. There are other minor macronutrients, but they're the, the big three. They're the ones we're really concerned about. And the combination of protein and carbohydrates and fat and the types of fat 
It was really, really important. And I had to learn this. I had to figure this all out. I had to accept the fact that not all fat is bad. See, marketing people are geniuses. They can put low fat on something and we immediately equate that to what? Healthy, right? I mean, I did, right? Um, they put low cholesterol on something and we all go, oh, that's good, I have high cholesterol. Except for the cholesterol they're talking about is dietary cholesterol, which by the way is not the same as bloodborne cholesterol. It's just not. But the marketing folks are smarter than most of us. They certainly were smarter than me and I had to learn to figure all that out. There's a lot of bad press about protein. In fact, most, uh, most folks in Western culture don't eat enough protein. Protein is super important. Whether you're vegan or not, you can, get, uh, you can be vegan or vegetarian and still get good protein. Protein is super important. It's not bad for your kidneys. It just isn't. Um, it turns out it's very important. I had to learn how to look at food and make an educated guess at macros. Not everything has a nutrition label. You go to the buffet or you go out to eat or you go to a friend's house and there are choices and you're filling your plate. I had to figure out how I could look at that plate and guesstimate, guesstimate. How many fats, how many proteins, and how many carbs? That's really daunting. It sounds daunting because guess what it is. But with practice, you really can figure out how to do it. And coffee, by the way, doesn't dehydrate you. Of course, there is a little bit of dehydration in any type of caffeine, but it doesn't overcome the amount of water that's involved in the coffee, which is really great because I love coffee. Thank you. So, how many calories should I actually eat? So I had to learn about BMR. Basal metabolic rate. Some people are thinking, why do I want to know that? But BMR is basically the amount of calories that your body needs just to be alive. It's pretty simple. That's what it is. In order for your body to live, it needs to burn up so many calories. That's called your BMR, basal metabolic rate. Then I had to learn about TDEE, which is hard for me to even say. Total daily energy expenditure. So, for example, how many calories do you burn up by doing your job? Doing the wash, walking up and down stairs, cooking dinner, whatever you do for your daily activity. Here's another really, really bad thing that I discovered. When you use some of these online calculators, they ask you about how active you are. We all think we're more active than we really are. The vast majority of us, unless we are professional hockey players or something, the vast majority of, of us have sedentary lives. We just do. That's just the sad, sad truth. We lead sedentary lives. So if you're ever going to use one of those calculators, make sure you plug it in that way. The other thing I learned was that a calorie deficit of just three to five hundred calories a day will cause me to lose a gradual amount of weight. I was not looking for a home run because if you remember what I told you earlier, if I was going to lose four or five pounds a week, 20, 25, 30 pounds in a month, I know how that story ends. I know how that story ends. Small deficit, small deficit of three to 500 calories can cause me to lose weight. So if I took my total daily expenditures, the amount of calories that I need just to be alive, add all that up, come up with a number, take three to 500 calories down from that, I could lose weight. Uh, I also learned that you don't get to add the calories back in that you, that you, uh, you burn off when you go to the gym. It is a sad reality, but it's true. And the other thing is, if you go to a gym where they have the calorie counters on the, the bike or the treadmill, don't believe it. It, it just, I think it's a marketing ploy, I really do, to make you think you're burning more than you really are. Burning calories, it's really hard. It's really hard. Sometimes uh, I've seen estimates about half of what those things would tell you. Is that right? About yeah, half? Everybody's different, right? So right. you don't know for sure, right? But, you know, sometimes if it, even if you're using things like, you know, all the thousand of apps there are, like if it says, it's like, oh, you burned 800 calories, it, it, it's likely to be wrong. It's likely that, yeah, it's likely that you, uh, you only burn four. Uh, speaking of apps, I learned how to use macro counting apps. 
there are a lot of apps. We all have smartphones, I can see. We all, there are tons of free apps out there that you can put your food in, uh, you can log your food. Some of them have databases. Some of the databases are good, some of them not as good. Um, but it will help you kind of track your food. It will help you track your food. And I learned how um, to kind of go through them and find the best ones that would work for me. And I learned and I learned and I learned and I still continue to learn. Every day I learn something new. So date night. Talk to you about date night. Non-negotiable. So uh, my wife and I have been married 29 years and we have two sons who are now adults. Uh, but when they were young, we started a tradition of date night. Sometimes it was two Friday nights a month. As they got older, it became four Friday nights a month. And date night was an opportunity for us to go out. It was usually never fancy. Um, it was a time to go out, get a small meal, have an adult beverage or two, uh, and just catch up. Just catch up. And that was not negotiable. Date night was staying. Date night was very important to me, very important to us, and it was definitely staying. So I wanted to continue to have an adult beverage. Glass of wine, mixed drink, glass of beer. Not six. The truth is I never really drank that heavy, but I do like to have a, a beer every once in a while. That was going to stay. If I went to a party, I was going to have a piece of cake. It's a birthday party. I'm going to have a piece of your cake. And I need to, have, I need to figure out how to do that, right? And I can't have that, I believe, was a, is a foolish thing to say. Unless there's a medical reason why you could have an allergy or, or something. I can't have that, I believe, is a foolish thing to say. Because I think it's self-defeating. And I think eventually that will be a problem. So what did I do? Remember I told you about outsourcing things? So I hired a celebrity trainer. Now that's kind of part of a joke. Um, show of hands, who knows who Gary Vaynerchuk is? Anybody? Okay, about half the room. Okay, so Gary Vaynerchuk is a social media maven, right? He owns something called um, VaynerMedia. He now just opened something called Vayner Sports. Uh, he has literally hundreds of folks that are involved in social media marketing. Lots of big name clients. Um, and as Gary was living his life at 100 miles an hour, his health wasn't exactly keeping up with his lifestyle. So he hired a young guy, he hired a trainer, his name is Mike Vacanti, and for two years Mike was under contract with Gary. He went everywhere with him, went on family vacation, went on trips, he would scout out restaurants that Gary was gonna have dinner at, and then text him what he should eat, trained him every day, and pretty much owned him for two years. At that point he's probably, I wanna say about 27 years old. After his contract was over, he became a free agent uh, and started an online coaching career. Now, I had known about Mike because I followed Gary. And so you would see Mike in videos and hear him talk about that a lot. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, I need some help and I want to outsource the physical training part because I knew I had to do that but I didn't want to spend the time and the resources to figure it all out. I was working on the food and my brain. So I reached out to Mike um, to put a plan together for me and uh, we worked it out and I got a monthly plan. And um, it started out with a warm up and then it started out on this day we do this, on this day we do this, and on this day we do this. It was exactly what I needed. So I didn't have to think about that piece. Picked up the plan, went to the gym. Simple, right? By the way, um, big box gyms, right? It's where I belong. Ten bucks a month. Belong to it for years. I am their business model. People who pay ten bucks a month and never go, <laughs> right? I was it. I proved their case study. Brilliant people they are, big box gym people. Uh, but I did. I started to go. So let me tell you a little story. Mike sends me the first program. Four weeks worth and a ten minute warm up. True story. So I go in the back of my big box gym and I put my mat out and I'm going to do this warm up. And after 20 minutes I had been through the first four things. There were 12. I pulled out my cell phone and I started messaging Mike. I used some unkind words. <laughs> How in the world am I supposed to do any of this? Any of them. I couldn't do, I couldn't, it, it, not that the warm up had push ups on it, but I'm here to tell you I couldn't even do a push-up. 
let alone get up off of the mat without grabbing onto something. Uh, but it didn't last, and as he told me, it would get better, and it did. It got better, and I learned. And strength training. Let me tell you about strength training. Strength training, I have discovered, is probably the single most important thing that you can do for yourself, man or woman, no matter what your age is. And it doesn't have to be with weights. That's uh, actually, a photo was taken on vacation last spring. It doesn't have to be with weights. You can do body weight strength training. Strength training is incredibly important. A lot of folks get into this rut, well, oh, I have to do cardio. I have to do cardio. Cardio is really important for your heart, for your lungs, not for weight loss. If you do copious amounts of cardio every day, every day, every day, it's going to help you lose weight. And when you stop doing it, it's going to help you gain weight. It's just the way it works. Been there. I know how to do that. I'm really good at bad things. Strength training, super, super important. So why is it important? Well, one of the things, I get this from my wife. I don't want to be all muscly. I don't want to be all muscly. Here's a hint. It really takes a lot of work to get all muscly. For you to actually have muscles that show takes years and a drastic reduction of body fat. The women and men that you see at the checkout line on the front of those magazines, it's more than just lifting weights. I'll let you think about what that might be. But it's not what we're doing, okay? You're not going to get all muscly. You're just not. Strength training, proper nutrition is the only known thing that works to hold off or rebuild bone mass. As the ladies in this room start to approach their 50s, mid 50s and 60s, you're going to hear about osteopenia, osteoporosis. Your bone density is going to reduce. Guys, it doesn't escape you either. It happens to you too. Proper nutrition, vitamin D, calcium, other nutrients, and strength training is the only thing known to hold that off and actually rebuild bone. It's not just to look good on the beach. Here's really important. You remember back when I said it had to be sustainable and it had to help me and continue to be productive? I had to continue to be mobile as I got up in years. My mother is in an assisted living facility. She's there because she's not strong enough to kind of hold herself up. She uses a walker. Uh, she uses guards to get in and out of bed. Handles in the restroom, the whole deal. She's there because it's for her own safety. Something should happen, somebody can get to her right away. If you walk around that place, that's why most of those folks are there. Getting up and off of their, uh, uh, up and down out of their recliner, off of the toilet, everything that we're going to have to do as we age. If we don't start building strength, we're not going to have the ability to do those simple, little task. Climbing stairs. Folks sometimes have to leave their home because the restroom's upstairs, their bedroom's upstairs. They can't do stairs. Ah, so the Happy Healthy Journey Bible. I track everything. I brought a copy of it here. It's kind of messy. I haven't cleaned it up, but I'm happy to share it with you afterwards. Um, but I, I tracked everything. I created a spreadsheet which, by the way, I'll share with all of you. Created a spreadsheet, and I took, uh, I want to say 26 different measurements. Actually, I had my wife do it. Um, 26 different measurements. We took photos, front, side, back. And we did it every quarter. Every quarter. And the reason why is because the scale doesn't always tell the whole story. Because if you're strength training and eating right, the scale maybe just moves a little bit, but all of a sudden you've dropped an entire dress size or an entire pant size. Everything, everything is in this, in this journal. Everything. Um, the, all of the programs that I got from the trainer are in the journal in case I needed to reference back to them. Photographs every three months. Um, measurements. The whole spreadsheet available the whole time. Uh, the other thing which was uh, really important that I did that I showed you in the very beginning, remember when I showed you that 42% body fat? So uh, body fat, I think if you're going to start on a weight loss or a, or a health journey that 
you, weight loss has to contribute to is I would recommend you getting your body fat measured. Now there's some, there's some uh, not problems, but there's some concerns with that. There's different ways to do it, right? There's uh, pinch calipers. Uh, there's what's called a DEXA scan, which is a kind of a low dose radiation. Uh, they're submerging yourself in, in water and they take a displacement measurement and there's an air displacement or bod pod method, right? None of them are completely accurate. In fact, the only accurate way to measure your body fat is to cut you in half and cut it out and weigh it, which is not really effective. So uh, it's effective, you just would never find out the results, right? So. What I recommend is you get your body fat done in the beginning and just continue to use the same method. And don't worry so much about what the number is, just worry about if the number's moving. Does that make sense? And that's what I did. That's what I did. Um, so body fat to me is really super important. So I had all of the body fat reports in there. So I had the body fats, I have the measurements, I have photographs, I have the workouts. Everything is in the Bible. So. It's not just to record it so I can show folks. It's because there are those times where you go, ah, what's the use? What am I doing? Right? Nothing happened. Nothing's happening. Because we look at the same, we look in the mirror, it's the same mirror. We see ourselves, we look the same exact way. And you go back and you open up the Bible and you start going, oh, now, now I see what was going on. And you can see your progress. And you can give yourself kind of a, a virtual pat on the back because you're making progress and you look at those measurements and you go wow 18 and a half inches to 15 and a half inches 10 and a half inches off of the diameter of my waist I'll let that settle in for just a minute taking photos taking measurements printing out my physical exam notes from my doctor who here don't lie who here on their phone right now has an app that they can look and find out exactly what their doctor has written about them? Two. Who here knows that you can even do that? Three. <laughs> right? Just about every modern, even semi-modern doctor's office has that ability. And there are tons of apps. Tons of apps. Follow My Health. Um, there's Chart. It goes on and on and on. There's a bunch of them. I won't name them all. You should have that app. Even if you're not on a wellness journey, you should have that app because that information belongs to you and you should know about it. One of the things that I found out when I was scrolling through what the doctor had to say about me, he was saying things that he didn't say to me, but he was putting it in a report. He was using words like morbidly obese, should lose some weight, should get some exercise. All the truths, by the way. All truths, by the way. Look at that. Look into that. If you need help with that, you can contact me and I'll help you figure it out. You should definitely have that app. You should definitely have that app. Every time I went to the doctor, I printed those notes out and put it in the Bible. Every time I got blood work done, I printed it out and put it in the Bible so that I could see exactly what was going on. Have your body fat measured. I talked about that. Get online with your doctor's office. I talked about that. So, self-evaluation. I had to figure out why I had this problem. This is that self-reflective, self-aware part. I overate. Kind of simple. But why? So I ate when I was bored, and I ate when I wanted to avoid doing certain things. I work primarily by myself, at least in the office, in a way of shop people, but I'm in the office by myself. In the office by yourself, you pretty much report to yourself, and no one has a clue what you're doing. So I get to that really tough thing, that uncomfortable thing, that thing I didn't want to do. Eh, I grab something to eat. That's what I did. And sometimes I even got in the car and went someplace to get something to eat. I ate when I'm bored. There's a video uh, visiting my sister and there's a whole bunch of family there. And I wasn't part of the video, I was kind of in the background. It was a video of the kids or something like that. But one day I was watching the video and this is what I saw. Just pretzels. The video was about eight minutes long and I never stopped. And I don't even remember why. Something to do. Something to do. Ate because it was comforting. And I ate because I equated eating with having fun. It's what we do, right? We have a party, we put chips, we put dip, we have a couple of drinks. 
get together with our friends. It's fun. It became a habit. Eating out of boredom became a habit, right? Now, folks say if you, if you uh, do something or undo something or not do something for 21 days in a row, you can undo that habit. Not true. You can make that habit shrink and you can cause the replacement to grow, but the habit never leaves you. So I, I didn't put in this thing, but something else I want to encourage you to do, if you ever have an opportunity, read a book called The Five Second Rule. Who, who here has heard of that? Anybody? Oh, you've heard of that? Yeah. I think it's a great book. So The Five Second Rule is written by this, uh, this woman. Long story as to why she did it. But one of the things she talks about was why we do the things that we do out of rote memory. Walking up the steps. Think about walking up the steps. Do you go right foot, left foot, right? Of course not. We just walk up the steps. Most of the time we run up the steps. But if you've ever been in an old house where the top step is a different height, what do you do? You trip and fall, right? You trip and fall. Why? Because your body's not used to that going from 8-inch risers to 10-inch risers or whatever it is, right? There's a part of your brain that's just a loop. And the loop is all the things that we do automatically all the time. Do you think about how you brush your teeth? No, you brush your teeth. That's what you do. Because sometimes you're yelling at the kids, but you're still brushing your teeth. Right? It's what you do. What she figured out was, um, if she counted backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and made a decision, she could disengage the loop and re-engage the frontal cortex and get things out of her way. So, she, um, she'll tell you openly that she drank a little too much and she had trouble getting out of bed in the morning because she was depressed because they were having some financial issues. And one day she's watching television and there was a rocket launch and she heard five, four, three, two, and the rocket went up and she said, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. Tomorrow morning I'm going to go five, four, three, two, one, and I'm going to get out of bed like a rocket. That's what she did and it worked. And she kept doing it day after day after day. And then there were other things that would kind of get in her way that she knew were just habits. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm not going to take that drink. And she replaced it. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to get some water. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to go talk to my husband or whatever the case was. So it fascinated her so much, she had to go figure out why. And so she did a lot of study for, uh, I want to say about two years. And she found out the science as to why it works. And also the science why one, two, three, four, five doesn't work, but five, four, three, two, one does. Very interesting. So I do recommend that you, that you read that book. I'm just learning about that now. That was part of the learning, learning, learning. Um, and I'm just starting to use it. But another tool that I'm going to put in my bag to kind of get rid of some of this uh, habitual uh, eating and bad habits. So that's me today. You saw that photo. You got that on the, uh, on the Facebook uh, invitation to come here today. I continue to learn. I'll probably never stop learning and this is where I am now. 157 pounds down from 222 with uh, approximately 20% body fat down from 42. My total cholesterol is at 118 without meds. The general acceptable scale is 100 to 199. My BP is a steady 120 over 78. I do continue to strength train. I cardio train for heart and lung health once or twice a week. Heart and lung health, not to lose weight. And I still honor date night. And I take the stairs whenever possible. So, you really need to be telling people about this. So let me tell you where that came from. That's a direct quote from my physician. Uh, in, I want to say, May of this year, I had my yearly physical. Uh, and I, I was probably about 8 or 10 pounds heavier than I am right now. Um, and I walked in, and he's just going through the numbers, and he's like, this is just awesome. This is just great. Um, and we're, we have, he's very thorough, so we have very uh, um, thorough physical. And he said to me, he says, you know, people your age get put on these types of medicines. He says, I do it all day long. People your age don't get taken off of these kinds of medicines. They just don't. Because you can take a pill. Oh, and by the way, those pills that I was taking, I still ate whatever I wanted. 
Still didn't get any exercise. Got my numbers good, but it wasn't any healthier. He just said, you really need to be telling people about this. And let me set that up for you. So we're finishing up, and he's typing in at the head. All have laptops, right? He's typing all the stuff in his laptop. Um, it's time for me to kind of get dressed or, or whatever. He, clo he closes the curtain. He walks out. He hears the door close. All of a sudden, I hear the door open back up again. He walks back in the exam room, takes the curtain back like this, and he says, you really need to be telling people about this. And turned around and walked out. Now, there's a guy who sees hundreds of patients every week. And I really need to be telling people about this. The three prescription drugs are gone. Uh, the doctor actually offered to uh, trade his numbers for mine. And I am now completely in control of my health. And that's the whole journey. It wasn't easy, and I'm still on it, and I'll be on it for a very long time, uh, with any luck at all. Uh, but I learned an awful lot. Uh, I learned um, what's good and what's bad. I learned what's right and what's wrong, what's fact and what's fiction, because there's, as I said earlier, a lot of information out there. Um, but I really have taken control. And when I go to that party and I have that piece of cake, I know what I'm doing. I understand what that's about. I understand the calories. I understand the carbs and the sugars. And I also understand that I don't need to have that big old wedge cake. I can have a smaller wedge of cake. Oh, and date night, Friday during the day, I shift my calories just a little bit. I eat a little less breakfast, I eat a little less snack, I eat a little less dinner or lunch so that I can have a little bit more dinner. So I shift that out because when we go out, we're less in control. My daytime eating, uh, on Monday morning, the first step on my way into the office is I go to the grocery store. I have a refrigerator and microwave, and I shop. And I buy everything I'm going to eat for breakfast, lunch, and snack for the whole week that morning. That's what I buy. I spend about uh, 35 or $40, depending on whether or not I have coupons, right? It's about $5 a day is what I spend. Everything I buy is fresh and uh, has good nutritional value. And I ring it in Monday morning and I load it up in the refrigerator and that's what I eat. And that really helps me. It helps me uh, because I, I, I'm not tempted by other things, which by the way is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, those temptations. Uh, I don't go out, so don't go out into the world where the other temptations are. Um, things are controlled. I actually, I actually, I have to admit this, I actually weigh things, but it just makes it easier for me. But I have a big digital scale in the shipping department, so I go out there and I weigh out my salad. It's kind of weird, but I do it. Um, and, um, you know, that's what I do, and that's how I control my food. My wife, bless her heart, has really um, helped me with the evening meals, understanding a little bit more about proteins and the right kind of carbs that I'm trying to eat and the right kind of fats. Um, she did not eat enough protein at all in her life, um, and she's starting to learn how to do that. I mean, we eat a typical Western, uh, got to get it done because we're in a hairy, you know, pasta and pierogies and that kind of stuff. It's what, you know, it's what we did, like probably a lot of you do. Um, and she's really, uh, really helped me out, and in, in doing so, because we're the only two in the house, has changed the way she's uh, eaten as well. Any questions? Oh, come on, there has to be a question. Thank you. When did you start your journey? Okay. Probably in a previous slide, I just don't remember. No, that's okay. So it's been about 18 months. Remembering that, like, the first two months was research, right? It was research. Eating with research. <laughs> right. Yes. So what do you typically eat in a day? So ah, gr types of food? Great question. So what do I eat in a day? Um, I'm not a big bref breakfast person. Uh, it's just not my thing. Um, I have typically three cups of coffee. By the way, I use full strength half and half. Why? Because I like it. And I count the fats and I figure it out. I like it. And that's what I do. Um, I have a Greek yogurt in the morning. Uh, and I always have some kind of fresh berries. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, berries, berries, berries. And there's lots of reasons for that. They're, first of all, I love them. They taste great. They're relatively low in calories. Um, they've got some good dietary fiber in them. They've got antioxidants, which are good for us. Um, I often have um, 
a protein cereal bar because it's quick and easy and I can eat that at my desk. I eat a lot at my desk. Um, I know I shouldn't, but I do because I have, I work for myself and you all know what that's like. Um, at, and that normally, you know, the cereal bar and the coffee normally happens between uh, seven and nine. Uh, the yogurt normally comes in around 11 with the berries. And then around one, I have lunch. I uh, typically have some type of lean protein, whether it's canned tuna uh, or grilled chicken or turkey, uh, sometimes pork. Uh, and it's either on a salad or on the side. And I also have a salad, uh, a big salad. You know those three and a half serving salad bags? Yeah, I eat a half of one of those, right? I eat like a serving in three quarters. Sometimes I eat the whole bag. I just do. I like it. Um, and that's what I eat. And then typically uh, I, I'm snacking somewhere in there and I snack. I love organic carrots because I think they taste really great and they're easy to keep in the refrigerator and I snack on those. And then I always have a piece of fresh fruit on my ride home because my routine is I get home from work, I change and go right to the gym. So I eat that fruit on the way home, kind of gives me a little carb bump and a little sugar bump, um, kind of takes the edge off if I'm hungry before dinner. So that's what breakfast and lunch looks like. So you're eating a bag of salad? I Sometimes. Mean a bag of lettuce. Sometimes. Nothing on it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I should have done. First of all, I don't just eat lettuce. I always get the vegetable mixes, okay. which has uh, radishes and uh, purple cabbage and carrots and pea pods and all kinds of okay. stuff like that. And I use a vinaigrette. I use a vinaigrette. And, and the bottled vinaigrettes, are not, they're not pure, right? They have a little sugar in them, whatever, but it's really not that bad, right? You got to live. Right? You gotta live. And it's all on the shelf. And I have to do easy. Right? I have to do easy because I'm fending for myself breakfast and, and lunch. And in the evening, we typically have uh, a lean protein. Uh, we typically have at least one vegetable. And not always, but uh, if we do have a starch, we have a quinoa, which I really like. We have brown rice, which I really like. Sometimes we go crazy and have couscous. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do like all of that. Uh, I do like all of that. Uh, the weekends shift a little bit differently because we're home and kind of not in routine. Uh, and like I said, with coaching baseball, sometimes you're running out and doing that kind of thing. Um, I tend to eat a late breakfast, uh, just the snack, and then a bigger dinner because we're really social and we're out a lot. And we're with friends or we're at restaurants or whatever. And so I try to bank some of those calories. I get them all in but I tried to bang some of them. Here's another thing I learned. I learned that um, when you eat real food, real food, you can eat a lot more. When you start to track real food, not the prepackaged stuff, eat real food, you can eat a lot of food. That's why I said I eat three quarters or of a bag of that salad stuff and some lean protein. You can eat a lot of food. I am never hungry. I don't do hungry. I don't do hungry well. It's not a pretty sight. You can eat a lot of real food. And that's what I eat. I eat real food. So what was the difference when you started this journey here, mindset, between other from Sustainability. Sustainability. Sustainability and education. Now, but what, what, what changed your mind this time to do it differently? Um, I knew that I didn't want to keep yo-yoing back. And I knew there was something that wasn't right with what I was doing. And that's where the education piece came in. And I had to figure that out. I had to figure the education piece out. And I'm still figuring that education piece out. Anything else? So do you ever have like a cheeseburger? In Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm just, I'm I, that's why I put, that's why I put, well, you know, here's the okay, thing. I am going to want a cheeseburger. No, of course. <laughs> of course. And date night oftentimes consists of cheeseburgers. Right? They just do. I just, I, 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 you know, I'm about 80%. About 80% on track. About 20%. It has to be sustainable. You know how I said... The reality is, is it's not what you do on occasion, it's what you do every day. Exactly. It's, it's, it's exactly right. If you have a consistent mode of operation, Every once in a while you have a little outlier and it's really no big deal. And the other thing is you can't beat yourself up for it. My wife and I were fortunate enough to go on vacation last week. You should have seen that. We had a great time. We had more than a few adult beverages. 
right? <laughs> we just did, right? And uh, we probably had some extra bread at dinner and, and, and whatnot. But you know, we also were staying on the fifth floor and we found the outside stairwell and we walked every day up and down multiple times, multiple times. Just because we knew, you know, we were probably eating a little bit more than normal and it happened to be, happened to be the type of vacation where you did a lot of walking and that, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's vacation. Yeah, going to have a slice of pizza. You bet, watch, you know. It, it has to be sustainable. You can't do the I can't thing because you won't stick to it. You may for four or five months, but you won't stick to it. It has to be sustainable. The thing is, the key to is understanding what it is when you have that slice of pizza. What am I getting out of that slice of pizza, right? I'm talking about, um, you know, fueling machine, right? I'm talking about fueling machine. It was a complete mind shift, fueling the machine. You put cheap gas in the car, the car doesn't run very well. You put premium gas in the car, the car runs like a top. So if you look at yourself, not, you know, not as a Volkswagen, right? But if you look at yourself as a, as a machine, a machine that you're trying to tune up and win a race with, and the race is life, and you fuel up with good fuel, proper nutrition, you may not make it in first, but you'll make it to the end of the race, and that's really where I'm trying to get to. But it's all real food. I don't buy, I try not to buy uh, prepackaged stuff and I certainly don't buy any of the, uh, the diet plan meals. I don't do any of that. And I don't do, I don't drink green cleanses or whatever that is. I don't do that. I don't do that. Um, I just eat real food. It really is my mantra. Eat real food. You, you really can eat real food. You can shop anywhere in the Western world and buy what I buy. So you can be on vacation or you can move to Las Vegas. You can do whatever it is that you, you know, you're going to do in the Western world and you can do what I do.